Lucy, thank you. So I'd like to start by thanking all the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak here and also to say that I'm very, very happy to be speaking not only at the IHES, but in a conference that is pretty much focusing on exactly the kind of thing that I do. For me, it's like a one-of-a-kind experience. So, okay, so start, I'll start by defining what a local topos is. And this, this is the definition that you have in SGA4 by Grothendieck. So a Grothendieck topos is local if the unique geometric morphism into set has an extra right adjoint which I refer there to as C, okay? What happens then is that, well, here's your original geometric morphism and you get another geometric morphism going in the other direction, okay? An example of this is sheaves on the Zariski spectrum of a local ring. This is where the name comes from. But you can also generalize this to any topological space having a point whose only neighborhood is the whole space. Another example, very simple example, that if you get bored of the talk, you can work this out for yourself, is take C, a category of a terminal object, and then the direct image functor there is just evaluation on that terminal object. So you're precomposing with the functor that p uh, picks out that terminal object, and then you get your left and right kind extensions there, which are going to be the left and right adjoints. Okay, that's another example. And as Joyal pointed out in the workshop, when you have a property of a topos, you can think of what would be the property of a geometric morphism, right? Generalize it to a geometric morphism, right? And so we can you can define what a local geometric morphism is. And I'm not going to explain exactly where the definition comes from. You can see that it's very, very similar, right? As in, well, if, if, your, if your direct image functor has an uh, extra right adjoint, the full and faithfulness comes out of the fact that you're now working on a slice, okay? So now your local geometric morphism isn't just going between two toposes, it's actually commuting with a bunch of other diagrams. And that's where you get that some things have to be the identity, okay? And so the situation that you have is, well, again, that C is full and faithful. So because of the string of adjoints, the, the inverse image functor is also going to be full and faithful. Okay? So we have this situation here now where C is on the right and, and this guy is on the left. right? And you have a geometric morphism going in this direction and another geometric morphism going in the other direction. Okay? So... You have an inclusion, the top one is an inclusion because C is full and faithful, and the bottom one is a connected geometric morphism, slightly stronger than a surjection, right, because F, uh, F upper star there is full and faithful. You can also compose the, these, these two geometric morphisms and get a further adjoint. A lot of the times I'll be a bit sketchy and I will mix these two guys up and you'll see that there is no real danger there. It facilitates things a bit, okay? Now, when you work with growth and toposes, this becomes even simpler now to think of because now again, I have the same string of adjoints here. I've given them different names, the names that I'll be using uh, from now on. So I is just the inclusion here, and A is an associated chief functor, and conveniently, my left adjoint is L, okay? And what you have in this situation, since you have an inclusion, is that you can fix the, the base category, and like C here is fixed, and just think of a stronger growth in the topology on the other topos, okay? And we know, we know th this information comes out of the inclusion that we have here, right? that we have an inclusion and therefore you, just, you can just fix, the, fix the, the base category of the site and think of a stronger growth in the topology, right? So my, the question, the problem of my, my whole PhD was, well, what information is L telling us about K, right? What, what extra information can we get out of L, uh, uh, which is a left adjoint, which is preserving finite limits, okay? And what the approach is to try to explore the symmetry that we have here of this triple adjoint. Not so much in the fact that we have a geometric morphism going one way and a geometric morphism going in the other direction, but first try to explore the fact that this is reflective here and this is co wants to be co-reflective, right? And so this approach involves defining what a discrete object is, which is pretty much a dual notion to what a sheaf is. Because the sheaves sort of belong to the inclusion, and now we're going to look at the co-reflection and see what's going on there. 
So a discrete object, well, you, you have a local operator already, right? You have a category of sheaves, right? And it's defined as the objects which are left orthogonal to the morphisms inverted by the associated sheaf functor. It's exactly the dual notion of, of a sheaf, right? And it's so dual that you can actually even just take epis here, you know? As in, and a sheaf usually just take, it's only necessary to take monos, you know? But here we just take Appies, but it can it works for any uh, morphism that's inverted by the associated sheaf functor, and so that is if you remember what the diagram for diagram for the sheaf condition is, this is exactly the dual thing, right? And you get a full subcategory of discrete objects. Okay. Now there's a theorem by Kelly and Lovier that if the category of discrete objects is co-reflective, then it's it's equivalent to the category of sheaves. Then pretty much you get a symmetrical, uh, com totally symmetrical situation here. You basically join those two together, and this, and this arrow here, which was the co-reflector, joins with the reflector here, right? And you get your triple adjoints, right? And uh, there's another theorem by Kelly and Lovier, which pretty much characterizes what's happening with respect to the site. And I think for a month, or maybe a bit less, I thought this theorem was mine, but then I found out that it had already been proved uh, well, more than 20 years ago, so yes. And anyways, uh, no, yeah. And so basically if you take, I took the theorem as it's stated in, in, uh, in their paper is in much more generality than, than I'm putting down here. I'm just putting in a simpler version so they can have, a, have an understanding of what's going on. So you take a subcanonical site, you don't need to take a subcanonical site, but I've taken it subcanonical to make things easier. And then inclusion of growth and ectoposis has an extra left adjoint if and only if each representable has a smaller k dense subobject. Okay? So let's break down what exactly this is saying. We have a smaller k dense subobject there, which I baptize as sigma. Okay? And it's not necessarily a covering sieve. Okay, it doesn't live in K because the covering sieves, they don't actually live in this category here, right? The, the sigma A is living in this category. The sieves lives in the pre sheaf category. What is happening is that a sieve belongs to K if and only if its closure contains sigma A, right? Because sigma A is a member of, of this collection here of J closed sieves, okay? There's a slight subtlety there. There's a, there are ways around, a ways around this subtlety, which I discuss in my thesis, but I won't get into them right now. Okay? So some of the properties of, of, of this uh, smallest covering sieve, it has some very interesting properties. So some of them is first that it's functorial also in, one, in the other variable, right? And so it's, it turns into a profunctor. So you can, you can, the A can vary, and it varies functorially with respect to the A. Okay, so basically we know that sieves are closed under pre-composition, but this one is also closed under post-composition, right? You post-compose with an F, you land in another sieve, okay? And one of the most interesting facts is that you can now define an interior operator on your topos, okay? You have an interior operator on the whole topos, which restricts to an interior operator on, on the, the sub-object vibration there, which is left adjoint to the closure. Right. This is the formula for it. Okay. Um, the explanation for this formula is also in my thesis. The important fact is that basically the sigma a's are the interior of the representables. You know. And so yes, and that is, you can also see that a lot of interesting structure is arising here. And you may also want to think, well, just take the transpose of the, the, the profunctor, and you know that you're landing in sheaves, right, because it's closed. And so you may also want to think of this as a functor going from C into sheaves into J. Okay? Now, here's a theorem of Kelly and Lovier, which gives uh, an, interesting, an interesting duality theorem that we have here, that there's an order-preserving bijection between essential localizations of the pre-sheaf category and idempotent ideals of C. This is a theorem that I did quite a few generalizations of it in my thesis as well. I'll only talk about one here. What do I mean by an ideal? Well, it's just a collection of morphisms that is closed not only on the pre-composition but post-composition, exactly like a smallest covering sieve. And it's idempotent. Well, this is the formula here, but 
pretty much it says that you can take an element of your ideal and you can split it into two different elements there, right? Okay. So basically, if you took the, the product of the ideal with itself, uh, thinking of the composition as a product, okay? So, now, here's an interesting result that came out in 99 by Lars Berkdorf, who was working with realizability topuses. But what he did in his PhD thesis was he axiomatized the notion of a local map of topuses. And this can come in quite handy as well. So basically, basically he's saying that you're going to get a local geometric morphism okay, between a topos and a category of, of, of sheaves here when you pick out a local operator if the following things hold. The closure operation has a left adjoint, like I said that it always does, right? And uh, he calls this a uh, principal uh, local operator. Um, I prefer to call it an essential local operator. Because if you remember the theorem, theorem by Kelly and Lovier, you can realize that this is actually gonna give you, it's gonna give you the essential inclusion part of the, of the local map, okay? This is just saying that the local geometric morphism is gonna have, is gonna be bounded which is not very useful in our case because when working with growth and ectoposes, all local geometric morphisms are automatically bounded. This axiom here is saying that basically your bound has a, dis you can calculate the discrete, a discrete object associated to your bound, okay? Which also comes for free when you're working with growth and ectoposes and you assume axiom one, right? It, because you're already gonna get by, the fact that you have a generating set there, you're going to get your uh, left adjoint, and then this comes for free. The, the, the more interesting axiom for me is this one, which translates to the, the fact that if you take an open subobject of a discrete object, then it's discrete. This is, for me, the most interesting one, because it's, it's slightly non-trivial. Okay? And um, this is what I say, oh, by open I mean it's the interior of it is itself. Okay? And the last axiom for me is slightly cheating because basically he's putting in these axioms to make sure that your left adjoint, uh, when it exists, is going to preserve finite limits. That's what he wants for it to be a local geometric morphism. And a result of Topper's theory says that if your functor preserves products, monos, and pushouts, it will preserve finite limits. This is one of those Topper's theory magic things because uh, pullbacks turn into pushouts and things like that. So he's pretty much just putting in what he needs to get, get products, you know. This, this one implies that things are monos, that, that it preserves monos, but other things as well, okay? So now let's look at what's happening when we take our topos to be uh, sheaves on a locale, a localic topos, right? In this case, since one is always discrete, um, you can easily check that it satisfies the, the, the diagram that I put there for an object being discrete, okay? Uh, when E is localic, we have that, well, the interior of sigma A is sigma A again, because sigma A is the interior of, of, of Y of A, okay? And so, and it's a sub-object of Y of A, we, uh, the representable, which is a sub-object of one. So, if the axiom four holds, right, which says that an open subobject of a discrete object is discrete, then you have that your smallest covering sieve is discrete. And then from then it becomes very easy to construct your left adjoint L. Your left adjoint L is just going to be tensoring with sigma, okay? It's going to be the left con extension along your nada of sigma. I sh I'll give a short proof of this, okay? Well, since, since, since sigma A is discrete, and that guy is dense, you can draw this diagram and you can see that the unique morphism there exists if you turn your head around or switch the diagram around, you can see that it's, it's a definition of discreteness. But it's also saying that sigma A satisfies the universal property that it needs to satisfy for to, to be in the image of the co-reflection, right? So we found that LA of YA is sigma A. And then it just follows from a jointness here. This here is this, the Yoneda lemma, okay? And this follows from I of A being a left adjoint to L of A. You get this, right? 
And from this, you can see that I've represented, right, this, this functor here. And, if, and basically, what you have looking at the tensor homo junction, right, we have that tensoring with sigma is a left adjoint to this functor here. Thus, let me just go back a slide, right? Thus, if this guy is this one, and this one has a left adjoint, is, this is the left adjoint, thus L must be... Okay, I've cheated a bit there. I've canceled out an A, but you can do that um, by precomposing with the I. This is just a mere, merely a sketch of, of the proof. Now, the generalization of the theorem by Lovier that I pointed out, uh, that I did in the case for uh, a locale, is that there's a bijective correspondence between local geometric morphisms, not, not essential inclusions, but local geometric morphisms and subfunctors of the onate embedding, which is just, well, my rephrasing of what an ideal is, right? Which are Cartesian and such that they are now idempotent with respect to tensoring, to respect to composition of profunctors. I think this is also saying that, well, basically you have uh, an idempotent profunctor co-monad here, but that's, that's just lots of names. You, you can just, it is what it is, right? Okay, now let's look at the case where, where your topos is a, is a pre-sheaved topos, which is also a fairly well-behaved case. In this situation, we have the associated chief functor, the most unpopular functor that we probably have in all of topos theory, because its description is usually horrible, right? You have to iterate this plus construction, so the associated chief functor applied to a pre-sheaf and then applied to an object is basically where well, you iterate the plus construction twice and the plus construction once is a co-limit, okay? But since uh, topology K had a smallest object, okay, this co-limit trivializes and it turns into this, right? And then it makes the plus construction very simple. You don't need to take a co-limit, okay? And then, again, we have the tensor homo junction again, okay? And the plus construction thus becomes this, which then by the tensor homo junction turns into this, right? And looking at the variables here, right, we can see that the plus construction also becomes representable, okay? Therefore, again, another string of adjoints here, you have L of A here is just going to be equivalent to this guy here, which is the plus construction, which is I composed with A, which again by the adjunction turns into this. And so L is pretty much just tensoring twice or tensoring with, with this tensor here, right? And now the question of whether L preserves uh, finite limits or preserves finite products reduces to flatness of this guy here or sifted flatness of this functor here, okay? So that's a well-behaved case because you have a tensor homo junction, right? Uh, what about the general case when you're looking at sheaves, right, on a, on a site? Well, then you don't have necessarily a tensor homo junction. You would like to use the same technique, but you don't, right? I mean, and so, so what are the barriers? Well, what, what's stopping us from doing this, right? And so one of the things is first, is sigma J continuous? Right, because we, we want to get closer and closer to, to Diaconescu's theorem, right? And the, the answer is, is yes, it is J-continuous. Um, here's a short proof. Um, you take a, a J-sieve, uh, S, and you, I pick a bunch of morphisms in there, right? Here, here's the sieve represented. I apply my sigma to it, okay? And then I take uh, the, the, the co-product of of the guys in the in the domain, right? And I want to ask myself, is this is this an epimorphism? And one fact is that if you take the co-unit of your junction and you do the cover image factorization, you get your sigma there. Okay, this is one of the many different characterizations of of sigma. And so, since this functor is J continuous. Well, this is definitely J continuous for the associated chief functor with respect to J, and L preserves co-limits and epis, therefore the composite is J continuous. Looking at this diagram, okay, you can see that 
Well, this is an epi because LA of Yoneda is J continuous. This is an epi because of the factoring that we have here, right? And since all these guys are epis, this one must be an epi as well. Okay. So we have a tensor homo junction, right? We also have Jaconescu's theorem that says that J continuous flat functors correspond to geometric morphisms. And we can subtract the, the, the J continuity, right, and get just that flat functors are uh, geometric morphisms, but instead of sheaves here, you have just, uh, uh, just a pre sheaf category. And what I would like to do is like theorem algebra. I would like to subtract this theorem, sorry, this theorem from that theorem and add it to this one. But that doesn't work, right? You don't have that J continuous functors are equivalent to, to, to adjoints here, right? That just doesn't work. And the, the, what you need is that for this guy to factor through sheaves, you need that its left adjoints send covering sieves to isos, okay? So that when you tensor with sigma, you get this, right? And for all, for all your sieves in J. But being J continuous is saying that it's an epi, Right, and now we just need we, we just need this morphism to also be a mono. Okay, we just need that. You know, tensoring with 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 monos will give us back a mono. And how much time do I have? Ten ten minutes. Okay, I can go into there are uh, many. Oh, okay, okay. I think I can go into again a sketch of the proof of one one of the I have many condi well not many three conditions for preservation of monos of this functor. I'll go into one of them, okay? So if you assume that C has pullbacks and you take, uh, you take a situation like this, where the G's are in, sorry, your G's are in your, in your sieve and, and your F's belong to your, your uh, uh, K sieve sigma. Sorry, it's not a K sieve, but your, your, your smallest covering your smallest dense subobject sigma. Um, you take the pullback. Okay, this is the pullback of of g and uh, g prime. Um, and then, okay, looking at this diagram again, you construct this other diagram where I've applied sigma as a functor to this area here, right? And I want the sigma to sort of preserve pullback up to the site, okay? So basically, instead of a represent, if, if it were to preserve pullbacks, you get a representable functor here. But instead, you can take another, just, just a covering sieve of J, right? And so, condition is that if there exists an R so, uh, such that this commutes, then, then your sigma will be preserving monos, okay? But, you can just take a much stronger assumption, which is that the sigma preserves pullbacks, and then your R is just going to be the maximal sieve, okay? which is what happens in, well, it's not what happens in the locality case, but it's, equ it's equivalent in the locality case to, to it being flat. So the theorem that I have is that if you have a small category and you start with a, a, a triple a junction there, right? Um, an essential inclusion, right? Uh, and you take its minimal sieves functor, right? This, this time it is a minimal sieves functor because we don't have a topology here. Then L preserves <coughs> finite limits or products if this functor here is flat or sifted flat. And you also get the slightly more well behaved version for locales where you don't need to tensor it again. It's going to be it's left at its Cartesian if and only if. Sigma is Cartesian because, well, since L has, has finite limits, Cartesian and flat are the same thing. And so, okay, and so the general case and how to control the general case, um, I've explored in more detail in my, in my PhD thesis, but I won't go into it now because I don't have the time. But yeah, it's, I don't think it is available online yet because I haven't had my Viva. But but it should be around after January or so. And that is all I have to say. Thank you. Have you questions?
Uh, have you tried to uh, have a look at uh, the notion of local uh, geometric morphism from the logical point of view? Or? No, I haven't. And that, that is one thing that I would love to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what, what is this saying about, you know, in, in terms of, of the, no, the geometric the theory? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That is that was one thing that I think is missing, yeah. right? Because we've gone all the way over to the site, right? But we need to yeah. go all the way to the theory, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can remark on that. I mean, mm -hmm. there's Urs Schreiber, who's not here right now. It okay. looks into cohesive type theory. So this extra mm. adjunction yeah, yeah, yeah. gives rise to some modalities, and he's been studying this a lot. Mm -hmm. So for the higher order logic, there are some answers already. Oh, okay, okay. I'll look into that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.